So I'm going to briefly recap what we discussed and then sort of talk about a number of different applications uh, ranging from like work, exercising, credit card, savings behavior, drinking, smoking, uh, fertilizer use, and so on. And then uh, um, that'll spill into next lecture uh, or go into next lecture as well. I'm going to sort of summarize where we are, what do we know about time preferences, what have we learned, what's useful from what have we learned for the world, and what things might be still uh, uh, up for investigation. Okay, so what happened so far is like I showed you a, a simple model of exponential discount, uh, discounting. Again, that's the workhorse model of um, uh, discounting. In economics, it's one of the most successful and most important models that people have written down in economics. The solo model, et cetera, like many sort of different important models, thinking about long run growth and so on, use this particular um, uh, model. So it's been tremendously important and successful. It has different implications that we discussed at length, both in class and, and lecture and in recitation, which is constant discounting, uh, dynamic consistency, and no demand for commitment. We discussed some evidence uh, that shows that um, uh, these assumptions, these implications are not warranted. And then we talked about um, a different version of this model, or like an extension, if you want, of that model, which is the quasi-hyperbolic discounting model, which adds an additional parameter um, that measures people's present bias or present focus, as people uh, call it sometimes these days which allows us to be more flexible and be able to look at short-run and long-run discounting um, uh, uh, in the same model, as in like there's one parameter beta that measures people's short-run discount factor uh, and another parameter delta, which is close to one often, that measures the long-run discount factor. That makes the model more flexible and we're able to uh, explain some phenomena that might be hard to explain otherwise. Any questions? on that so far, or last time, or the like. Okay, so then next we talked about sophistication versus naivete. So this is the issue that we discussed before, which is um, present bias um, creates time inconsistency, right? When thinking about the future, we want to be patient. When the time actually comes, when the future actually arrived, uh, we, we are impatient. So then the key question uh, you might ask is like, well, do people understand the time inconsistency? We talked about two different extreme assumptions or versions of this. One is full naivete, which is the idea that the person does not realize that she will change her mind. Um, when thinking about the future, um, she thinks she's going to follow through on her favorite plan. When the future comes, she will be patient. But then, of course, uh, uh, the future arrives and surprises happen, and the person is surprised by their own present bias. And sort of there's false optimism about future patients, uh, and sort of the uh, uh, over and over again, the person might say this time is different. Um, second, uh, a second extreme assumption is uh, uh, um, full sophistication. That is perfect foresight. The person actually understands their beta perfectly well and uh, understands that she, in the future, might not stick to the plans that she has and might change her mind. So um, she does sort of her best, given the future self's anticipated uh, 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 changes in behavior. So taken into account as a constraint what the person will do in the future, um, the person uh, optimizes uh, uh, that way. There's no surprises about future present bias. The person has rational expectations. Okay, those are the two broad extreme assumptions um, that we discussed. Now, how can we tell, how can we actually tell, so if, I, if you wanted to, to, to know about uh, uh, your friend and try to understand, uh, is this person naive and so or sophisticated? How can we actually tell what, whether that's the case? What do we do? What data uh, could you collect from your friend or from people that you see? Yes? And what exactly would you collect? Um, I guess if you if you could asking them like what they think they're going to do and then seeing how mm -hmm. what they act. Right. So one thing you can do is co collect the person's beliefs. You can ask them what are you going to do in the future, and if the person mispredicts what they're going to be in the future, in particular if the person thinks they're going to be more patient in the future than they actually are, so if they think their beta in the future is higher than it actually is, that would su uh, that would suggest um, uh, uh, at least some naivete, right? Hmm? What else could we could we uh, elicit? Yes. <coughs> There are some choices that people make that wouldn't make sense if they're not being sophisticated. So, for example, if you see 
see them restricting their choice then in some way that would use sex as a person. That doesn't make sense. Exactly. So if you offered them commitment devices, and we said, here's a commitment device. You can change your future behavior in certain ways that make certain behaviors in the future more expensive. So for example, you might tell your friend, or your, your friend might offer to you, if I don't do the problem set until uh, Friday 5 PM, because you want to have like fun Friday night, uh, I'm going to pay you $100. Um, now, um, if you uh, make that choice, or if, if somebody offers you that option to like pay them hundred dollars in case you haven't done the problem set by Friday 5 p.m., uh, that choice does make, doesn't make any sense if the uh, if the person is an exponential discounter. That person only makes sense if you are present bias or if you have self-control problems in some way, and you must be sophisticated in some sense. So it must it must indicate some form of sophistication. To be clear, it doesn't indicate uh, perfect sophistication. Uh, you might be only partially sophisticated, uh, but at least it, it, it indicates some form of sophistication. I'm going to talk about partial sophistication um, in a bit. Um, the same awareness issue does not arise with exponential discounting. Why is that? So in some sense, if you thought about, like, if you have looked at, like, the exponential discounting model, there's nothing about sophistication and naivete. There's no parameter that measures that. And why is that? Why do we need, like, a delta hat or whatever? Yes? Right, exactly. So the, the whole issue only arises because there's time and consistency. The future self wants different things that the current self does. In the exponential discounting uh, model, there's no such issue. There's no time and consistency. So the future self will always do what the current self actually wants to do unless circumstances change. So we don't need any parameter that sort of looks at like how much is the future self deviating um, because that's not even an issue um, in the first place. OK, so then. Um, uh, we talked about sort of extreme assumptions. So these are extreme assumptions on the, on the two ends. One is like full naivete. You're entirely naive. You just cannot uh, 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 imagine that your beta in the future will be different from one. That's full naivete. And then there is um, the other extreme assumption, which is full sophistication, which is beta hat equals beta. Right, essentially, it's like you understand entirely what's going on with your future um, beta. But of course, there's a whole range in between from beta to uh, to one uh, uh, that beta um, hat could um, could take, and that's what we refer to as like partial uh, naivete. That is to say, uh, beta hat measures the, the, the beliefs about future beta. The extreme cases um, are useful to think about, but Presumably, the truth is somewhere in between. So the intermediate case might be sort of the most relevant one, uh, which is beta um, hat is between beta and uh, uh, 1. So that is to say the individual understands that they will experience present bias in the future. So I know that I have some present bias in the future. As an example, say, um, my beta might be 0.6. I might think, I, I understand to some degree that my future beta is not 1, but I might think it's like 0.8 or the like. So I understand that I will be present biased in the future, and, but I underestimate the degree of um, uh, present bias in the future. And so if I'm partially naive, and, and this is what Maya was saying earlier, um, I, I might um, demand commitment devices anyway. I might understand I have, a, um, I have a, a problem in the future, so I want some commitment devices. But I could also overcommit. I could sort of demand commitment devices that are actually not useful for me. Why is that? Because I sort of underestimate how bad my self-control problem is. I understand there's a self-control problem. Somebody offers me a commitment device that's fairly weak. I say, great, that's going to help me. I'm going to, that's going to help me follow through. But then surprise, my self-control problem is actually worse than I anticipated. And then I have a commitment device, and I'm actually failing with that commitment device because the self-control problem happens to be worse uh, than anticipated. Any questions on this? We're going to uh, uh, talk tomorrow about like um, a, a little bit about like solving problems with partial naivete. We talked about solving problems with full naivete and full sophistication. Partial naivete is a little bit trickier because it sort of requires iterating forwards and backwards. Uh, we talk about this briefly um, tomorrow. OK, so now demand for commitment. We already talked about this before. Here's sort of a formal definition. 
Uh, it's defined as an arrangement entered into by an agent who restricts his and her future choice set by making certain choices more expensive, perhaps infinitely expensive. Right? That's to say, at the margin, you might sort of pay for something uh, um, that might make your restrict your choices or make your choices in the future more expensive. If it's like not available at all, you think can think of this as like the price is like infinite. Right? So I make I, I don't want to eat donuts tomorrow. I can make donuts more expensive, more and more expensive. If it's infinitely expensive, donuts are just not available uh, uh, to me. Um, so now, of course, the, as we said before, time and consistent preferences, uh, the selves differ, and this is, again, repetition, uh, selves differ between what you want today versus in the future. You might sort of worry about misbehaving in the future. If you understand that, you might uh, uh, want to discipline your future self by demanding a commitment device. Okay, so who of you is using commitment devices, or can you give me an example of a commitment device that they have used in the past, successful or not? Yes? Um, I have an app on my phone where I can set a timer and then swap to my phone until the timer is off. Does it work? Yes. <laughs> should try that. Um, yes? Um, I have a browser extension that um, blocks certain sites at certain times of the day. Does it work for you too? Uh, somewhat. <laughs> Why does it not work? Um, because it's way too easy to just turn it off. <laughs> right. Exactly. So that's an example of a commitment device that's sort of partial in some ways. It's not sort of strong enough. So either you can sort of substitute to like, you know, Firefox or whatever, like another browser. You can substitute to your phone. You can substitute to your friend's phone even and so on. Um, or, you know, you might just actually be able to turn it off yourself. But you can circumvent. I think there's sort of some uh, uh, apps that have sort of options that don't allow you to do that at all. But you guys are like a lot of uh, CS majors, so maybe you can uh, get around that as well. Uh, any other examples? Yes? Uh, when you go shopping, like, find more vegetables or something so that you feel like, oh, like, now I have to eat them, otherwise I just wasted my time and money. <laughs> so what do you do, actually, then? So what, what's your commitment device? I guess it's like making the choice to eat something else like more expensive, because I have to like go back to the grocery store and I have to pay for it. But so what, but how do you commit, then? Or like, what's restricting your options? No, but like so, so, so you know that you're going to do that in the future potentially. So now, how do you avoid or change your future behavior? Can you sort of incentivize yourself, or can you make sure? So another version of that would be like, so what people often do is like, um, when they buy, buy, for example, potato chips or the like, they buy really small bags. In part, sort of knowing that like if they buy a big bag, which actually would be cheaper, they would just eat it all. So then you have like only very small portions, and then you know uh, if you want another one, you have to sort of go to the store and buy more. So that's like a version. It's sort of a version of a commitment device where essentially you commit yourself to if you want to eat more potato chips in the future, you have to go back to the store as opposed to having like a big bag that you can just consume in one uh, uh, session. Yeah. Any other examples? Uh, yes. Carrying cash instead of more. Like if you're uh -huh. I see, and so uh, that's interesting. So uh, yeah, exactly. So like um, you know, credits. It's interesting because in some sense, in some other settings, carrying cash is sort of not helping. But you're saying like instead of having a credit card that you can spend usually as much as you like, depending on what, what your credit limit is, you might say I'm going to go out uh, with hundred dollars, and like once I've spent the hundred dollars, I'm not going to spend more. I have to sort of go back home or or the like, and then I might sort of not uh, give in to temptations. The reason why I was Hesitating a little bit is like in developing countries, in part in some settings where I work, uh, uh, you know, lots of people have lots of cash on hand from like their work. For example, cycle rickshaw drivers, they would have um, a lot of cash on hand because they get like trips of, they get paid for every single trip and then they have lots of cash on hand. It's actually quite bad because then they can spend it on lots of things uh, 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 any day and they're, you know, having it in their uh, a liquid or their savings account or the like would be uh, uh, a different form of commitment device that might help them. There was more. Um, yes? There's a show, Nathan, for you, where he like, wants to help people lose weight. So uh -huh. He takes a picture of them, like a very embarrassing picture, and gets a notarized letter that gets sent out in two weeks to mail for just five pounds. And uh, does it work? Yeah. <laughs> wow, interesting. I've not heard of this. What is it called? Embarrassing the pictures. I see. Yeah, but you can see, like, uh, yeah, it depends a little bit, I guess. Um, uh, uh, yeah. 
So uh, when asked, does it work? Does it work on average or what's being shown? Or you know, how costly is it to fail? But it sounds like at least for some people that's in fact um, effective. Yeah? Uh, there are some accounts where you can put money and it's a bit harder to take the money out to a bank. Mm -hmm. That's kind of useful for some people in service. Each one, you put a lot of money there and you can take it out that easily. Right. If you really need it, you can just go to the bank. Right. In fact, a lot of retirement accounts um, in the U.S. and many places have uh, penalties for early withdrawal, right? So a lot of like uh, um, many employers that offer like 401k and other savings uh, vehicles, essentially that's like a retirement uh, sort of <clears throat> tax deferred retirement savings, often sort of subsidized by the employer. But often one com uh, one condition is that like you have to pay a 10% or something penalty to withdraw it. Similarly, I think for some savings account that's sort of similar. And the idea is very much like helping you uh, 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 resist temptations to like uh, change your plans. So you're going to plan for retire, like saving for retirement or something else. But in fact, you might sort of withdraw early um, uh, if you're tempted. And then usually the penalty is only like something like 10% or the like, because when people have actual shocks, like you know health shocks or other issues, they want to be able to take out the money at some penalty. Um, uh, so they don't want to have it to be entirely illiquid uh, because that would, you know, that, that would be bad for them. Any other example? Yes? Uh, I have an alarm clock on my phone where I have to take a picture of something. So I'll like, get up and go to the bathroom and take a picture of this thing. Does it work? No. I take the picture and I go back to bed. I see. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, does it work sometimes? Yeah. Sometimes, I see. Yeah, so there the, the issue in some sense is like, if it doesn't work, then you're kind of like worse off than before because you slept like worse uh, uh, than you would have otherwise, and you know um, there's no benefit of you getting actually up. Yeah. One more. Yes. Uh, would like societally implied commitment about the, like no shave November or like some sort of variance on that work? Of what exactly? Like no shave November or like variance of this would that imply commitment device? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the um, in some sense, there's often uh, some commitment devices are essentially sort of public attention of the like, where people are announcing one way or the other publicly, which is kind of what you were saying earlier, um, where society in some sense has some um, uh, uh, influence, where people sort of would say they would publicly declare that they're going to lose weight, they would publicly declare that they're going to uh, save money and so on, and then there would be sort of social shaming in some way or the other um, to do that. Now, uh, what you want, so in some sense, if it's just society imposing things on people, that's not enough. What you want is a person actively sort of making some announcement or some statements with the goal of like making it more costly not to follow through. OK, so um, uh, as I said before, demand for commitment requires at least some partial uh, sophistication. I have some examples for you here. One is like stick. I don't know if you have any of, has any of you used stick? No? OK, so stick is um, a website um, uh, founded by an academic, uh, Dean Carland, and co-authors. What stick does is um, it's a commitment device that works in some sense in the way I was saying before. For example, um, uh, would you, if you want to sort of commit to certain behaviors, for example, if I wanted to finish a paper draft by Friday night, I would have to find a referee. I would, for example, ask Aaron to be my referee. And I would say, Aaron, um, uh, I'm going to give you my credit card information. And uh, if I don't finish the paper uh, by Friday night, I'm going to pay $100 either to Aaron or to some charity. Could be anti-charity, could be the pro-smoking, pro-whatever um, uh, uh, society. Um, the money is going to be uh, uh, gone. And so then Friday night comes, Aaron is the referee who uh, I can then sort of uh, uh, decide or will decide then whether I have actually followed through. Did I actually write a draft? Is there an actual paper um, that's done? And uh, if it's done, then nothing happens. I don't have to pay any money. If it's not done, uh, the money is uh, gone. And since the credit card information is on the website, um, uh, they can actually just withdraw that money. What's the problem with this um, commitment device, potentially? Yes? Yes, exactly. So like, I tried to use this a few times in grad school, and my friend was my referee, and then you know, Friday night would come, and then I would sort of just convince my friend to like, I'll pay you dinner if you, if you, uh, uh, <laughs> if you um, uh, uh, let me uh, get through. So you need a very good friend who is actually sort of then insisting and sort of credible, uh, uh, potentially. Or you know, your enemy could be your referee if you, if you want it, who's happy sort of then to take your uh, money. But I think it's worth trying. You can try it out and see whether it works. I'd love to hear some thoughts on whether it works uh, uh, or not. Um, there's clock 
Anarchy, which I think is, um, uh, is a, uh, uh, coming out of MIT. It's, a, it's an alarm clock that runs away, which is kind of similar to, to um, to what you mentioned earlier. Um, there's also Taki, which is the alarm clock that jumps around, and, and you have to sort of find it. Um, uh, there's sort of um, some forms of, uh, this is a, a fake uh, alarm clock, so I don't think it actually exists, where essentially if you don't get up and press a button on your, on your alarm, you essentially give money to, to charity or anti-charities if you want. Um, there's this thing called antabuse, which is quite interesting, which is um, uh, uh, a drug that essentially interferes with the metabolism of alcohol. So this is some people have trouble metabolizing alcohol anyway. So when they drink, they flush, they turn, uh, they um, uh, get headaches, uh, uh, they have to throw up and uh, feel unwell and so on. So for them, drinking is very unpleasant as it is. And it turns out there's a drug um, that can actually sort of reproduce those kinds of um, uh, 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 behaviors or, or feelings. Um, and it's uh, essentially you can take it, and then for the next 24 to 48 hours, you will not be able to metabolize alcohol. There's also versions of that that are sort of implants for like a months or the like, but essentially they make alcohol consumption very unpleasant. And this is sort of meant to, to help people who have problems with alcohol consumption, uh, that like if you want, don't want to drink tomorrow or in two days from now or the like, um, or the next month, you can take it and then commit to, to uh, uh, not doing that, and then alcohol consumption becomes very unpleasant uh, when, uh, when consuming alcohol anyway. It's a little bit dangerous, and is, uh, or it can be quite dangerous if people then drink anyway because there's sort of an alcohol uh, antabuse sort of uh, a reaction that's quite dangerous. Um, so it hasn't been particularly successful, in part also because people sort of fall off the bandwagon. So if you are essentially take that daily or like every second day, um, what happens then and people start wanting to drink and then they just stop taking the antabuse and then they have to sort of just wait it out for 24 hours or the like until the drug is out of the system and then they um, uh, uh, drink anyway. But in principle, it's like the ideal commitment device because essentially the only reason for you to take this, uh, uh, this drug would be to reduce your future um, drinking. Um, there's also sort of uh, various versions of like self-control devices which essentially either restrict certain websites that you can go to, you can restrict yourself, or it restricts them to certain hours, or you can sort of give yourself a budget um, uh, for a number of hours that you can use certain websites um, for. Any questions? So um, uh, I also have a video of commitment devices, which um, I'm not sure that the audio actually works, so you have to try this out. If not, I'll show it to you um, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so as you can see, I, um, <clears throat> I think we can learn a lot from uh, watching movies and I love TV, so um, um, uh, w what can we learn from this? I think that can actually, we can learn a lot about sort of uh, commitment devices and whether they work and why they work or why they might not work. So w what, did we, what did we learn? Yes? Right, so just making like future choices more expensive might not be enough, right? I might sort of say I might have self-control problems, now I'm gonna increase the price of my future behavior, but that doesn't mean that it actually works. It might just be more costly and I have to climb up the ladder or whatever, but then I might still eat the cookie and that's not helping. Hmm? What else did we learn? But I think you have to find a balance. Because if you make the penalty too high, you're not going to use it. Right, exactly. So what they did essentially, they made the penalty or they essentially made the price of cookies infinitely high. They just sort of gave them away to the birds. Now they don't have any cookies at all and sort of then they're going to eat no cookies whatsoever, which is kind of not what they wanted either. Right? Hmm? And I think another lesson is that once you've uh, made uh, one of these commitment devices so costly that you can actually just re uh, transfer it to another temptation good. Yes, exactly. That's what I was saying earlier. You might sort of restrict your browser. You might sort of like shut down Chrome or even like your entire laptop. But then if you start surfing on your phone, that's not really helping. So in some sense, there's like substitution to different potential either sort of goods or devices and so on or technologies uh, that might sort of undo your um, commitment device. So they need to be sort of like foolproof in some sense in the sense of like being able to not substitute you to other things. Um, Okay, so first, um, uh, uh, substitution across temptation goods can mitigate the usefulness of commitment. If essentially you have like other vices or other things you're gonna do instead, then it's not really helpful to shut down one thing uh, uh, only. So you have to sort of think about like, 
if I don't do the, the behavior that I'm trying to prevent, is there sort of other behaviors that I might gonna substitute to, towards, um, uh, uh, and then it's not gonna be helpful um, uh, either. Now, it's also helpful to think about like, what is it actually, what is it actually required for a commitment device to be helpful to a person? So first, kind of obviously, in some ways, the person needs to have some self-control problem uh, in the first place. There needs to be something that in the future, some behavior you want to change. Second, there needs to be some sophistication, right? Like frog and toad, they kind of know that they're gonna eat too many cookies, they need to sort of understand that. Third, and this is what um, was said earlier, um, the commitment device needs to be effective, right? We need to have something that's sort of strong enough to be able to help us um, overcome our self-control problems. And then fourth, it needs to be, the person needs to actually think that the device is effective, right? If I sort of don't have faith in myself, I think this is not useful, then I'm never gonna uh, uh, take it up. Or conversely, I guess there's issues potentially with like, uh, uh, naivete, there's two things that naivete could do. So one uh, part in naivete, what I was already talking about before, which is to say, I might be naive in the sense I'm saying, like, I, know, I don't have a, if I'm fully naive, I might sort of think, I don't have a self-control problem, it's not really bad, so I don't really need a commitment device in the first place. That's one version where I sort of under-demand commitment, where I say, like, I don't actually need it, it's not helpful for me um, uh, anyway, in the future I will behave, so I might not demand commitment. Another version is to say, I might actually demand commitment devices where I over-commit myself in a sense, like, I think the commitment device is actually helpful, while well, in fact, it is not. So, like, frog and toad were not doing that, in some sense, they sort of, like, understood, to some degree at least, um, uh, 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 pretty well what they're gonna do in the future. I think they sort of underestimated the substitution uh, in this case in the sense of like they thought like giving the, uh, uh, the cookies uh, to the birds would be sort of helpful, but in fact then they sort of underestimated the, uh, uh, the substitution, and in the end, you know, they're gonna be worse off because now as he's gonna like make the cake anyway and then eat a lot of cake, he could have as well just eaten the cookies um, in the first place. Any questions on this? So now, um, let me sort of turn towards some like academic papers and sort of actual um, uh, empirical um, uh, uh, setups. So this is the paper that you um, uh, 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 hope I'll read, which is um, Ariel and Wurtenbroch. Then Ariel was actually a professor here at, um, at Sloan at the, and did a bunch of experiments, mostly with um, MIT students uh, uh, at Sloan. MBAs. Uh, and so these are 51 uh, executives at Sloan. Um, uh, these are sort of highly incentivized individuals in the sense that they take classes. Um, if, they don't, if they fail a class, if they do badly in a class, they have to actually pay for it themselves, so they really are incentivized to do um, well. They had to submit three papers in a the class. They get a 1% grade penalty for late submissions, which is um, uh, uh, quite a bit. There were two groups. Group A had even the space deadlines. Group B had um, the option to set their own deadlines. And um, now um, the first sort of um, uh, uh, result here is that there was demand for commitment in the sense that like 68% um, of people chose um, uh, deadlines prior to the last week. So when given the option, when do you wanna set your deadlines over the course of the semester, 68% of people chose deadlines that were not uh, uh, the last week. Why is that demand for commitment? Yes? Exactly, like you, there's no reason, unless you have sort of issues with self-control or the like, you just make it essentially um, uh, costly for you to submit late. If you're worried about submitting everything late, um, that's a good thing for you to do, uh, and it might help you. Again, notice that it requires some sophistication. You need to sort of understand your future um, uh, behavior uh, to do that. Now what they find is like they find no late submissions, which is interesting by itself, but in particular, they find that like group A has higher grades than uh, group B. Okay, group A is the, the group that has evenly spaced deadlines uh, 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 compared to group B um, that has the option to set their own deadlines. Uh, it is consistent with self-control problems in the sense that people set their own deadlines um, uh, that are early. Uh, what else is it consistent with? What did, what did we learn from that? What did we learn from the fact that group A does better than group B? Yes? Um, yeah, so in some sense, the, the commitment devices that people chose for themselves was um, not strong enough or like weaker than the evenly spaced deadlines. Now notice the evenly spaced deadlines are in the choice set of people. Like if you choose your own deadlines, you can just say I'm choosing evenly spaced deadlines and you should do as well. If you're perfectly sophisticated, you would do as well as the group A. 
But the fact that the groups, uh, group B is doing like worse sort of tells us that people are not optimally setting deadlines. Either they don't, there's a fraction of people who don't choose any deadlines. You know, there's at least 32% of people who sort of say, my deadlines are all at the end. So maybe these are naive people. Or even among the people who set deadlines, they might choose deadlines that are like further back in the semester and they do worse than in the evenly spaced deadlines. So what, what did we learn? So people do set early deadlines, quite a few of them. So we learn about um, people are at least partially or some people are sophisticated, but they're only partially sophisticated. They don't set deadlines uh, optimally, which is sort of consistent with people being uh, naive, at least in some way. Yeah? I was wondering, uh, does it make sense to, to try to find a difference between uh, not adequately measuring your commitment and being wrong at estimating how long it will take you to do the paper? Right. That's a great question. So the question is, um, so there's two things that are perhaps uncertain when you think about the future. One is your present bias, your preference parameter about like uh, uh, how much work you're going to put in like today versus tomorrow and how much you're going to procrastinate. A second question is about like your beliefs about your effort costs in some way or the other, which is like how costly is it for you to actually do the problem set or write the paper and so on. And you might underestimate how tedious it is to do. There's sort of a large literature on what's called the planning fallacy. People always plan too many things and like think whatever they plan uh, uh, takes uh, shorter than it actually does or put differently things always take longer than people think when they make plans and the odd thing is that also is the case even if you take that into account so in some sense even if you're aware of the planning fallacy and you plan and you know that people are gonna things are gonna take longer somewhat oddly enough people are even taking longer even if you take that into account but anyway so um, the question is kind of like how can we separate um, um, uh, uh, that. I think that's, from this evidence, we cannot separate this. There's sort of like cleaner experiments that are more careful about this. In some sense, the if it were just about like underestimating effort costs, then you would not set your own deadlines necessarily. Like, like the setting early deadlines is consistent with like self-control uh, issues. But just from the performance, you're right, that could just be people underestimate uh, effort costs as well. In general, I think this is hard to separate in many uh, situations. The key part about the self-control problems about the time and consistency is the demand for commitment, which sort of reveals that people have some form of self-control problems uh, uh, related to time preferences. Any other question? So now, uh, there's one concern is the two sessions are not randomly assigned. Why is that a problem potentially? So we have, you know, like, we have 51 executives, 25 or something, 26 are in one and 25 are another, uh, but they're not randomly assigned uh, uh, across the two sessions. Yes? Right, so there could be sort of like selection, people sort of switch sessions. I am not sure, recitations, I'm not sure that's actually uh, uh, possible. But setting that, so that's surely one problem, like selection into the different groups. Uh, setting that aside, uh, what other um, problem do we have? Yes? That was something like if the two sessions are at different times and there's some advanced class that we can the same time as one session but not the other, we can end up with more advanced students in the section, which could affect like, how good they are. Exactly. There could just be other, um, sorry, this is a version of what you were saying earlier, so I misunderstood a little bit. Exactly. There could be like uh, people are, for other reasons than the actual treatment, uh, people might, uh, one session is early, one is late, one is on Thursday, one is on Friday, uh, one has a better TA, one has a worse TA, or whatever, people might sort of select into different, so the characteristics that people um, have when they select into, when they end up in session A versus session B might be different. So what you compare is essentially different types of people. Um, second, there's only two sessions or sections. That's essentially an issue of like sample size and statistics. We're going to talk in one of the recitations about that in more detail. But essentially, the bottom line is that like if you randomize at uh, or if you were to randomize, which they haven't even done here, but if you were to randomize uh, at the level of a section, then if you only have like two sections, that's essentially uh, not enough because you might uh, face correlated shocks. What is that? For example, it might be like one TA is better than the other, and one, one 
one class, uh, A or B, the group might do much better than the other, not because of the deadline policy, but just because of the TA. Or again, it could be that like the recitation is early in the morning or and people don't pay attention or whatever. There might be many other things happening uh, and so on. So in some sense, the sample size is A, too small to start with. 50 people is very small for an experiment. Two, if you randomize or if you, if you have only like two treatment groups, um, uh, you need like more clusters, as people call it, more sort of um, uh, 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 items of randomization uh, overall. So now um, there's a second experiment that they did sort of to deal with the first issue. This was sort of like, um, again, not a huge sample, but uh, you know, somewhat better. It's uh, 60 people and now it's like randomized into three treatment groups. One is evenly spaced deadlines, B is like no deadlines, three is like self-imposed deadlines. This is now like a proofreading exercise over 21 days. This is now randomized at the individual level, so it's not in groups anymore, so we get a little bit away from this cluster issue that we had before. Now, what is an exponential discount to do in terms of um, um, uh, performance? What do we predict uh, what's gonna happen? So like a person with beta equals one, what do we say uh, is gonna happen to the performance of these groups? Uh, yes, which one, all of them, or? Um. <laughs> so let's start with the self-imposed deadlines and the no deadlines. What kinds of deadlines is the exponential discount you're gonna set? None, somebody said? Yes. And yeah, like why would you set a deadline? You don't need a deadline, you're gonna just do it whenever it's, it's best to do. There might be some, you might get sick or like some other shocks might appear in the, in the course of the semester, so deadlines will just restrict yourself. So you will not self-impose any deadlines. So early deadlines essentially just limit flexibility, that's not helpful to do. You don't need to sort of uh, self-impose any deadlines. And then um, you might sort of do weekly worse, uh, or in, in group A you might do a little bit worse because essentially uh, shocks might happen or the like. Uh, there's no reason to believe that like if you restrict your option you might do better. Group A might happen to do as well as C and B, but at least they're gonna be weekly worse uh, in part because you know people get sick and, and, uh, 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 around deadlines or the like. Okay, so what about a sophisticated person uh, uh, with you know, beta hat equals beta smaller than one? Yes? Can you explain more? So, so the, the evenly spaced deadline will do better or worse than no deadlines to start with? Uh -huh. And why is that? Um, because they, like, if they have present bias, then they'll like procrastinate, so then they would have like three things to do at the same time. Exactly. Exactly, so that should help. And then the self-imposed deadlines, there you know you can optimally set the deadlines, you can probably do at least weekly better than the evenly spaced ones, because you might also take into account you know, some constraints that you have in the semester, like your family is visiting or the like, uh, that might be sort of like, you, you, so even the spaced deadlines some might not be optimal because of that. If you self-impose them and you're perfectly sophisticated, you can take into that into account. Right, so, so you know, deadlines can help, and you know, um, flexible deadlines tend to be uh, preferable because you can sort of take into account your uh, individual specific costs that you might uh, face. Okay, what about the fully naive person? <coughs> yes? So no deadlines and self-imposed deadlines should be the same because if you're fully naive, like, you don't think you need deadlines. Right. Correct. 
Correct. So as before, the evenly spaced deadlines, since the person has beta smaller, or some people have beta smaller than one, the evenly spaced deadlines likely do better or help people do better, unless they sort of like miss a lot of deadlines anyway because of procrastination. But assuming the deadlines are sort of helping people space things out better, they uh, uh, they kind of do better than the no deadlines case. And then the fully naive person says, why would I set any deadlines? I don't need any deadline. Flexibility is good. I'm going to do it early anyway. Of course, that's not going to happen. Um, but then essentially, uh, B is doing the same as C because the person does not set any deadlines uh, at all. Okay. So now, what about the partially naive person? Yes. Can you say more? So um, I guess the answer is like to some degree it depends. So we still have like uh, A is better than B. So if people have beta smaller than one, the evenly spaced deadlines still as before uh, are going to do uh, uh, somewhat better than the no deadlines. Now, for the self-imposed deadlines, so essentially two things can happen. One is like the person might actually set some deadlines that happen to be actually helpful. If they're sufficiently sophisticated, the deadlines might actually help at least some people. But for some people, they might set over-ambitious deadlines. They say, oh, I'm going to get it done all next week. Well, it turns out that's actually not true. And then they sort of set two early deadlines, and they have to rush, or they miss the deadline, or the like. They might actually do worse. So there we have essentially no clear um, uh, uh, predictions. Some commitment should help. So C could be better than B. But individuals might also overcommit. So C might actually be worse than B. So that's essentially there's no uh, empirical, uh, clear empirical um, prediction. Any questions on what I showed you here? Yes? Yeah. So you mean like a subsample of people who happen to choose evenly spaced deadlines? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so the issue there is essentially, so one thing they were doing in the paper is to say, let's look at the people who set evenly spaced deadlines and say, when they, uh, how are they doing compared to people um, in the control group or the like. The problem with that is like these people are selected in certain ways. Like if I sort of just, um, uh, uh, this is a subset of people that's non-randomly selected. They, you know, we know that they chose certain deadlines. So in some sense, we know that they're different in some ways compared to the average person in the group. And these could be people who are like more productive, less productive, et cetera, and so on. So the clean design, how you would do that is essentially what you would do is you would um, ask people to uh, 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 ask for their deadline choices and then randomize them into different um, uh, deadline regimens. So either they get their choice or not. So you can actually estimate the treatment effect on those kinds of people and then look at uh, are the evenly spaced deadlines or those treatment effects on those people worse or not. But I worry that in that kind of uh, analysis, what's non-random here, or what they're choosing is like a non-random subset, and compare that with the control group, they're sort of that's correlated with other stuff, and that's not necessarily uh, giving you a causal um, uh, effect. Um, having said that, um, you know, when you look at the, um, the, uh, the evenly spaced deadlines, they could sort of make things worse in some ways in the sense of like, even for people with beta smaller than one, it could be that people miss the deadlines because they're procrastinating and so on and so forth, or they, uh, they have some shocks of the lake, so it's not necessarily obvious that they do better. That's sort of all under some uh, assumptions. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. 
So now what we find is like A is doing better than C is doing better than B. So this is essentially true for like errors um, detected, it's true for delays in submission, and it's also true for like people's earnings in the uh, entire exercise. So now what we have is like A is better than C is better than uh, B, so what is that consistent with? Well, it seems like it's consistent with like some partial um, naivete. In some sense, admittedly, um, uh, the prediction of partial naivete is a little bit loose in the sense that like all we're saying is A is better than B and uh, you know uh, uh, then the comparison with C could go either way. So sure, it's consistent with partial naivete, um, but it's also like only suggestive in some sense because there's no clear prediction uh, in that uh, case. However, we can reject sort of like the other cases. We can reject the exponential discounting, the sophisticated present bias, the fully sophisticated one, or the uh, fully naive present bias person because you know those predictions are not uh, borne out. So the only case that sort of really is left is the um, um, uh, partial naivete uh, one. So let me sort of to summarize what we saw. Yeah, well, um, so the result is that deadline setting improves performance. That is ev evidence of some present bias being like essentially beta being smaller than one. Uh, it's also um, uh, uh, consistent with partial naivete. People set deadlines, which is consistent, they set early deadlines, which shows some demand for commitment, some form of sophistication. Um, then result two sort of says deadline setting is suboptimal, which sort of suggests that beta is smaller than uh, beta hat, or beta hat is bigger than beta, which sort of means that essentially people um, seem to uh, underestimate their self-control <coughs> problems that they have in the future. So that's sort of broadly speaking some support of uh, uh, the beta delta model with partial um, naivete. Any questions on this paper? Okay, ah, yes, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was asking, is it like what you have to like partial sophistication or partial naivete? So this is what I was discussing earlier, partial naivete being, meaning that, um, let me just go back for a second. This is what I was discussing here earlier, partial naivete meaning that, so we discussed two cases before, which was full naivete or full sophistication. Full naivete meaning that beta hat equals one. Full sophistication meaning that beta hat equals beta. And now, if you sort of take, a, take the case in between, which is um, uh, where you see what I have here at the bottom, which is beta hat equal is in the middle of uh, beta and one, or in between beta and one. So essentially, you understand that your beta in the future is not one but you sort of underestimate um, uh, 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 how small it is. So you know, as I said before, my beta might be 0.6. I might understand that my future beta is not one. So I understand it's smaller than one, but I might think it's like 0.8 or 0.9, which is to say I overestimate my future beta to some degree. Uh, while I get it right that it's not one, I might sort of get it wrong in the sense of like saying it's not 0.6. In fact, uh, I might think it's higher than that. Okay, let me go back to, okay, so, so in some sense, these are nice experiments, and they're useful experiments to help us sort of understand is there evidence for this model, is there evidence for some of the predictions that we have, but it's still fairly contrived in the sense of like, it's pretty, it's kind of like, especially in the second experiment, it's kind of like a lab experiment that like, really what we want to know is like, in the real world, are commitment devices A, helpful in some sense, do people want them, and B, are they actually improving behaviors in certain ways? Should a firm use commitment devices? This is actually helpful improving, for improving uh, a firm performance. So there's a very nice paper by Supit Kaur, Sandal Mulanathan, and Michael Krimer, who sort of investigate this question, using uh, data entry workers in India. So this is um, um, a full-time job for people. This is the primary source of earnings um, for these workers. These are people who are like sort of recruited as data entry workers for the course of 13 months, so uh, what, like over a year, um, as like a typical data entry worker. So sometimes there was a job ad that said we're looking for data entry worker, we have data to be entered. People would answer that job ad and then sort of start working um, uh, uh, to do a data entry. Uh, output is measured as it is usually done in many data entry um, uh, companies by uh, measuring the number of accurate fields entered in a day. Um, this is sort of measured by doing dual entry, as in to say that the data is entered twice, it's then matched with the other person, and sort of the number of um, uh, errors or discrepancies so is sort of then defined as an error rate, and if the error rate and the error rate sort of uh, 
you, you match to different people over time so I can sort of back out your error rate, uh, how, how good or bad you are. So people are essentially incentivized to, to, do, to work fast and incentivized to uh, enter stuff uh, correctly. Uh, workers are paid a piece rate uh, using a, with a weekly paycheck. They're paid once a week. Um, there's no restrictions on hours. People can show up whenever they like. They can stay for as many hours they like on any given uh, day. There are no penalties for absences, so you can just, if you don't show up on a given day, nothing uh, happens. This is what the data entry task looks like. There's essentially some data. This is kind of interesting. This is data coming from Kenya. So Michael Kramer and Sandal Mulanathan were working on some Kenyan uh, data uh, where they had like a huge uh, amount of data from Kenyan sugarcane farmers over the course of 30 years, some records, uh, historical records that they found. They wanted them to get entered. So like, well, how do we get them entered? Well, India is the place to do that. So they got them entered. And then when they sort of hired lots of people to enter the data, they thought, well, why not uh, uh, run an experiment to learn about self-control among workers uh, while doing that. So what they would do is they would show these like scanned images of these pages, and then there's like a sort of like a computer software, pretty rudimentary, that way you can sort of enter uh, the fields uh, in your data set. Um, now, the commitment device is, um, a com is a dominated contract that looks as follows. So the, as I told you before, workers are paid a piece rate W. Uh, it's a linear piece rate. That's the con core control contract for their production. So for whatever production, think of production as how much the correct entries that you produce. For each correct entry that you make, you're going to get paid uh, a W. Now, uh, the dominated contract looks as this. This is the red one that you see here, which is until uh, a target T, uh, I'll talk about the target in a second, until the target T, you pay W uh, over two, which is like half as much as before. And as soon as you reach T, the target, you're gonna be paid W for the entire uh, production that you make. Why is this a commitment contract? So if I ask you to choose uh, your target T, if you choose a positive target, why is this a commitment contract? Yes? So if you go less, you're penalized for it by less Right. That's right. So there's no value of um, choosing this contract. So if you are an exponential discounter, you might just choose T equals zero. The reason being that there's no point in like choosing a high target. Who knows what's going to happen? You might get a headache. Your kid might get sick. The computer might not work or whatever. For whatever reason, there might be shocks, uncertainty that might make you not reach your target. And so if you choose a positive target, the only thing you can do from this positive target is you see, you can do only worse, right? It's a weekly dominated contract uh, in terms of like your payments. So there's no reason to actually do that. But why might the worker actually choose it anyway? Yes? Um, because, or like earlier, you specified that the workers can come and go as they please once they finish the work, and so there's no real like, set schedule. So right. Or think that they know themselves, and think that they'll push off all the work until the very last minute, et cetera, et cetera. And so they might want the kind of device to incentivize themselves to finish their work in a time. Exactly. I might sort of just be like, you know, slightly below T or the like. I might sort of be tempted to go home. Um, you know, my friends call or whatever, and I might just not want to do it. It might be just a tedious day. It might be really hot. I have really goals to work a lot, and sort of I want to incentivize my future self uh, uh, to reach certain targets. That's exactly right. So um, I think this is, uh, uh, we already said all of that. Workers can choose the T in advance. They can choose essentially on the previous day. They can choose T equals zero. Um, they also have a uh, randomization of paydays to be able to look at payday effects. What do I mean by that? Uh, I told you like workers are paid weekly. Either, and so they randomize the paydays. What they do is they randomize the paydays to be Tuesdays, Thursdays, or Saturdays. So that you can sort of allow for day of the week fixed effects. That's kind of something that's not interesting. But essentially, you can look at uh, when a worker is paid uh, in a given week, are they more or less productive on that day compared to the previous days, and so on and so forth. What does the exponential discounting model predict about paydays or payday effects? Should you work harder on a, on a payday? Yes? Uh, no, because you're time consistent. 
Right, exactly. Like your delta is like 0.95 or the like. It doesn't really matter whether like the, the daily discounting should be essentially close to, there should be essentially close to no discounting between different days. You might have a yearly delta of 0.95 or the like, but then between today and tomorrow, two, day, uh, two days and three days from now and so on, doesn't really matter. So if I'm working today and I'm paid today, uh, it's the same as if I'm working today and I'm paid in like three days. However, if I'm a quasi-hyperbolic discounter, well, what's going to be the case is like, um, if I'm working on some days, I'm working today, and I'm going to be paid today. Well, then I'm going to work harder. Maybe I get the money right away. I can buy a nice meal. My family is going to be happier, and so on and so forth. Now, notice that requires some form of liquidity constraints, right? And something that if I have a bunch of cash anyway, it doesn't really matter whether I'm going to be paid today versus tomorrow. But assuming that some workers are liquidity constrained, essentially whether they paid today versus um, tomorrow matters a lot when the reward comes. If you think about like today, it's like 10 AM. I'm typing and typing. Now I think about like when do I get the reward? Either it's on the payday, you're going to be paid at like 5 p.m., so you're going to get essentially a nice meal on the same day. Versus if you're paid in five days, that's really far away in the data, beta delta world. Your reward for working hard is coming much later. Okay, so um, uh, so we think you know quasi hyperbolic discounters would um, put in higher efforts on paydays, assuming there's some form of liquidity constraints. Um, there should be close to no difference between other days. That depends a little bit like what's the horizon of the beta that we talked to uh, uh, about before. Okay, so now what do they find in this paper? They find essentially um, three results. The first result is there's demand for commitments. There's sort of people choose dominated contracts. That is to say workers select dominated contracts uh, about 36% of the time. This is a lower bound um, for the extent of time, time and consistency for three reasons. Reason one is some workers might be naive. They might sort of think, you know, they don't need any targets. Well, in fact, they would benefit from targets, so they, you know, they might under, under invest in this sort of technology. Second, people might think this commitment device is actually ineffective. In a sense, saying like, look, this is sort of what we're talking about with the frog and the toad. They might be, they might have like time and consistency issues. They might just not be a strong enough commitment device. And so then, you know, if I have a day where I just don't want to work, then if that's not going to get you over the target, well, then uh, uh, I might not choose this commitment device, not because I'm not, uh, uh, I don't have like present bias, but because it's just an in, not effective enough or of a punishment for me uh, uh, to do. Uh, number three is people might prefer flexibility and they're risk averse. These are issues like, you know, they might have like children that get sick, they might have headaches and so on. They might just be risks that's unrelated to their present bias or the like. The computers might be bad, so like they had different computers at different speed, you might end up with a really bad computer and then, you know, um, uh, you might not reach your target. That's nothing to do with self-control or present bias, but rather with sort of external risk. And if you're really worried about risk, then you might not choose uh, a positive target either. Um, second, they find offering the dominated contracts increases outputs. That is to say, if you compare groups that were like on some days offered those contracts compared to other groups that were uh, uh, randomly selected to be not offered those contracts on those same days, um, they find that being offered this commitment contract increases production by 2.3%. Now, you might say 2% is actually pretty low, um, and that's true in absolute terms. That's not a lot of money. But if you think about sort of um, what other options does the employer have, well, one thing you might want to do to increase workers' output is sort of double their wages or just increase wages overall. Now, it turns out that like um, uh, uh, they also have some piece rate variations, so they can actually estimate how much of a piece rate increase do we need to achieve these effects on productivity. And it turns out the impact is actually corresponding to like an 18% increase in the piece rate wage. Now, if you're an employer, you don't want to pay people like an 80% higher piece rate for like a, a you know two or three percent increase in productivity. That's just not worth doing. It's just like a bad deal. I mean, depends a little bit on your costs and benefits of production, but that's a very ineffective way of getting workers to 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 be more productive. And, uh, and it's a costly thing to do. You're going to incentivize a bunch of inframarginal people uh, uh, to do that. Instead, offering commitment devices in the setting is actually free. In a some sense, for the employer, you might actually pay people less. Some people don't treat your target, you can actually pay, pay W over 2. Now, you actually don't want to do that because you know, workers will be not happy and, and you know, uh, uh, probably get annoyed with you if you do that too much. But the technology is actually free. Here's a thing that you can offer to your workers. They're going to be 2% or 3% more productive. Um, that's actually a big deal for a lot of companies in terms of the margin soft and small, um, and a much better instrument in getting workers to be more productive compared to increasing people's wages, because wages obviously need to pay. 
Any questions on that? And then a third, and this is sort of consistent with like a model of self-control being really sort of the driver of this is payday effects predict people's demand for commitment. I'm gonna show you this in a second, but essentially what they find is that they're A, they're payday effects. What do I mean by that? Uh, if you plot essentially product, production over the course of the payday cycle, so here's on the very right hand side of this graph, you see people's payday productivity compared to the productivity on the day after the payday or seven days before the payday. You see people essentially are more productive on payday, they produce more on paydays compared to like previous days. And so the, what you see essentially is like a constant increase towards the day of the payday. Now somebody was asking me previously about quasi-hyperbolic discounting or hyperbolic discounting, um, uh, uh, which models is right. When you look at this graph, this actually doesn't look very much like quasi-hyperbolic discounting. This looks a lot more like hyperbolic discounting, as in like there's sort of like a smooth increase. There's not like a jump up um, uh, on the day of the payday, people are more productive, uh, but it's rather sort of more consistent with uh, uh, true hyperbolic discounting. That's more of a detail here that's not that important for you, but I wanted to point that out. Yes? What's the scaling unit on the y-axis? That is a great question. I think it's production, so I think um, this is not a... This is not a great, I think these are units of production. I don't know exactly what the um, um, fraction is in terms of production, uh, but it must be like a few percent of production. I can look this up, uh, but it's like units of production, which is surely not what you want to use uh, here. Um, yeah, and so then, um, so, so what we find here is that essentially people are more productive on paydays compared to the day after the payday or compared to like six days before the payday. Um, and then we find another graph, um, which is a quite nice one, which is to say, High payday workers or high payday effect workers are more likely to select positive targets. What do we? Um, what I mean by that is they split the sample into workers who have high payday impacts um, and low payday impacts. That is to say, when you look at the workers and look at like um, which workers are more productive on paydays compared to uh, on other days, you can sort of split the sample into two. Some workers are much more productive on paydays compared to other days. Some workers are not. So what you see here in the graph is you see essentially the blue dots. These are workers who have high payday impacts. These are workers who are much more productive on paydays compared to other days. And you see the red dots, which are workers who are essentially pretty much, they have low payday impacts, meaning they kind of work the same on paydays versus on other days. And then what they show on the, so then on the x-axis, they show experience. This is like essentially, uh, think of this as the course of the study. These are like, you know, something like 150 days. Um, they have sort of different uh, uh, work days in the sample where like essentially over time, uh, uh, people get to choose over and over their targets. And what you see essentially is that uh, the blue graph, the blue dots tend to be a, higher than the red graphs, meaning that people who have high payday impacts, these are workers of high payday effects, they're like more productive on paydays, they're more likely to choose um, uh, uh, positive targets. So I should have said on the y-axis you see the fraction of people choosing positive targets. Okay, so what we see essentially is two things. One is the blue dots are higher than the red dots, meaning that the people who have high payday impacts, they are more likely to choose positive targets. Sort of suggesting that so the underlying reason why people have high payday impact is self-control. You're more, more essentially uh, productive on paydays because you're present bias one way or the other. And that also then predicts uh, 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 whether you choose the target. So people have higher self-control problems as revealed by the payday effects. Those are the people who are more likely to choose positive targets. Second, we also see um, that the blue dots tend to be uh, trending upwards uh, in the graph. You see on the right, the blue dots are higher than on the left in the graph, meaning that as people have more experience in the study, when they have like 100, 150 days in the study, they're more likely to choose positive targets, consistent with some learning about self-control um, over time. Right, so they learn over time that choosing positive targets is a good thing for them potentially that makes them more productive. Uh, you don't see such a thing uh, for the red dots that seem to be essentially flat or constant uh, over time. So that was a lot of information. Uh, are there any questions on that? Yes? So, uh, arguably there's lots to do with the salience of the payday, right? So on the payday, I have to come into the office and do the work, so I might as well like type a little longer to earn a little more. On other days, you don't really have that incentive, like you're not getting paid. So there are other jobs where like you get paid at the end of the day, every day, and then like you don't really find the payday effects in those kind of jobs, right? 
Right. So exactly. So there, there, there's an issue on like when you think about these payday effects, um, what exactly do we learn from that? So one way to think about the payday effects is kind of like the story I was telling you, which is to say on days when you come in, when you type, when you work, you're going to be paid in the evening and you work harder because your, your, your reward is closer to you, uh, to your effort. Another explanation that you were saying is like, well, what if workers are just like liquidity constrained? What if like their children are hungry, et cetera, and so on? So you come in on that day because you want a, work, you want a, a paycheck. Once you show up anyway, you might as well do some work, and you're going to end up being more productive um, uh, uh, that way. Um, that's surely in part going on. I have sort of two responses to that. So one response is like, well, we find that the workers with high payday impacts are more likely to choose positive targets, which sort of suggests there's an underlying issue, which is self-control problems that sort of like drives both the payday effects and sort of the high, um, uh, uh, the, the, the positive targets that people choose to demand for commitment. Second and more subtle in some ways is like people are liquidity constrained, people who don't have cash there's often like a reason why they don't have cash, which is often because they haven't saved in the first place. Now again, that's a little complicated, but essentially, um, if somebody's very liquidity constraints, never has cash, often that's coming or the underlying reason might be present bias or some form of self-control problems to start with. The reason being that like, if you really had such a value, high value of having cash, you should just save it and have it in your home or like try to like uh, save money on your bank account and so on. So usually we think that when people are really liquidity constrained, often that's an underlying reason of um, uh, present bias or some form of self-control uh, problems. Having said that, there's also some other reasons why people can't save because you know it might be they don't have access to bank accounts and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, let me tell you one more application uh, and let me sort of um, continue with the rest of those um, uh, uh, tomorrow. So this is sort of like a classic study, um, in fact, uh, uh, done in Boston, or Boston area health clubs. So this is De La Vigna and Malmendier, and what they did is they looked at health clubs and different options that people did in gyms when they had sort of choices between the following or the following kind, which is monthly fees of over $70 for unlimited use of the gym or a pay per visit fee of uh, $10. If you had that option or those two options, which options would you choose or why would you choose one or the other? Yes. Right, exactly. So like, why pay more than, why pick option uh, number one if you only go three times? Um, uh, when I was teaching the first time, uh, I was doing exactly that, in fact. Um, 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 but exactly, as you say, it's sort of if you make like a, if you understand how often you go to the gym, uh, why choose option one if you don't go at least uh, seven times? There could be some transaction costs or the like, but surely if you go only once or twice, you should not choose option uh, one. Now, of course, some people might choose option one anyway. Why might you do that? Yes? Right. So one, uh, one option is like essentially change the future prices. So notice that the marginal cost of going to the gym in option two is like $10, right? Every time you go, your marginal cost is $10. In option one, the marginal cost is zero. So what I'm trying to do is change the marginal cost in the future uh, to make it more favorable for me um, uh, uh, to go. What else uh, could be going on? So one is kind of they could use this as a commitment device. What's another explanation? Yeah. Exactly. It could be like essentially, and there's two versions of that. One version has to do with like beta delta or, or, or present bias, which is to say I'm just underestimating my future uh, present bias. I think, you know, my beta is like 1, but in fact it's like 0.5. I think I'm going to go 17 times, but in fact I'm going only twice. Um, that's one option. Another option that was also mentioned earlier was about like underestimating the costs of future exercising. That is to say, what often happens when people sign up for the gym, often they're already at the gym, they're like really excited to exercise and so on, and they might underestimate how costly it actually is once they sit at home in the evening, coming back from home from work and so on. They might underestimate how it feels, how costly it is for them to actually exercise. Nothing to do with self-control specifically, but it's just it's a tedious thing to do. They might underestimate how tired they are and so on and so forth, with some form of like underestimation of the cost. That's again hard to separate in many cases, um, but that could also be going on. 
So what they find then is people uh, uh, exercise on average 4.3 times a month in the first year. That's about $17 per visit. And of course, you should be choosing uh, option two. Before canceling, consumers go 2.3 mo uh, months on average without using the gym at all, which is kind of like, you know, it's even tedious to cancel the gym uh, 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 and actually go there. And I did actually exactly that as well. Um, so um, how do we think about quasi-hyperbolic discounting here? Well, so the gym get goers would like to exercise a lot in the future, being naive, that's what they think they will do. So you know, overestimate what they will do. To save on gym costs, um, they buy the monthly um, uh, uh, membership. So that's kind of what the naive person does. When it comes down to exercising, the short run impatient kicks in, and they don't end up ending the uh, membership much. That's very much like sort of underestimating or overestimating their beta or underestimating their self-control problem. Now, what does a sophisticated person do? We already discussed that as well, which is they also prefer to exercise a lot in the future, but they realize they don't want to uh, do so later. So what they want to do is they choose the monthly um, contract as a form of commitment device in a sense of like making future actions, uh, changing prices in the future, they make it now cheaper to exercise compared to sit at home by sort of changing the marginal costs in the future, and they might even be willing to pay for that. So they might actually say, I know that I'm only going to go like three or four times, but you know, if I don't choose that contract, I'm going to only go zero one times, and it's worth for me um, uh, uh, to do that. So now, there's a different version of in which one could do commitment devices about um, uh, dealing with temptation, which is a very clever um, bundling of temptations paper by Milkman and others. What they did, instead of offering commitment devices directly, what they did is they um, bundled two things. Um, I told you previously about like investment goods and leisure goods, and so investment goods are things like going to the gym that you do not enough of. Leisure goods are things that you uh, enjoy in the present and you might be do too much of, uh, of that. So now what you can do is you essentially bundle those things. So what they did is they offer people the option to only listen to audiobooks, addictive audiobooks at the gym. And so then you can only sort of do that while you're at the gym, and you might come back to the gym, not necessarily because you want to exercise, but because you want to listen to your audiobook. Uh, this can also backfire of a friend of mine also in grad school um, who uh, was watching lots of TV shows and he convinced himself that he could only watch TV shows um, while uh, being at the gym. So then I would be in the office and he would sometimes come back from the gym totally exhausted because he had watched like three episodes uh, of, of certain TV shows uh, while being on the treadmill. Um, and you know, so he was kind of like uh, uh, over-exercising because of his uh, consumption, uh, his bundling of uh, um, temptations. But in this case, for, for so you have to sort of figure out how to calibrate this right. But it could be a way of getting you essentially to, by bundling essentially pleasant and unpleasant things at different points in time, by bundling them in certain ways, it might make you sort of help you overcome two issues at a time, which is one, you go to the gym more often, B, you might not sort of watch too much TV if you can convince yourself uh, to actually follow through. They do find, in fact, bundling of temptation is effective uh, until the Thanksgiving break when sort of everything uh, goes downhill uh, in their study. Okay, that's all I have for now. I'm going to uh, continue on uh, tomorrow with uh, the remaining parts of uh, uh, time preferences. Thank you.